1. Did Lisa copy Travis Scott? Gabriel Moses, the director of Travis Scott's MV for Fine is accusing Lisa of plagiarizing his work, he called her out on Instagram, I don't usually jump on the plagiarism bandwagon unless there's some solid evidence, but Lisa's situation is a bit too fishy to ignore, when Lisa's video dropped, it was like deja vu, the outfits, the editing, the camera angles, it was all very similar to Travis Scott's MV, and considering Travis's video was released just a couple months ago, it a paint a flattering picture for Lisa. Now, if we're to believe what director Gabriel Moses said, that Lisa's team reached out, got a big fat no, and then went ahead and copied the concept anyway, that's straight up plagiarism. If they hadn't asked and just went for it, it could have been passed off as inspiration, but to ask, get rejected, and then do it anyway? That's a slap in the face. At first, I was willing to give Lisa the benefit of the doubt, maybe it was heavy inspiration, not outright plagiarism, but if they actually reached out beforehand, it shows that the asking was just for show, and they didn't really give a hoot about using someone else's concept, and let's get one thing straight, this isn't about defending Travis Scott, I'm not a fan of his work either. The part of his MV that Lisa allegedly copied was pretty distasteful, lining up a bunch of East Asian girls with identical 60s dictatorship slash cultural revolution era haircuts and then rapidly switching their hairdos. It's a blatant play on the Asians all look and dress alike stereotype, it's disrespectful and tone deaf. So, while I'm not waving the Travis Scott flag, Lisa's team copying him is embarrassingly obvious. 2. Jenny got busted vaping indoors, spotted by fans in one of her YouTube videos, the footage was quickly deleted after the online backlash, and now her agency has issued an official apology. I personally think the backlash was deserved. Jenny wasn't just vaping indoors, she was blowing smoke directly at her makeup staff, that's messed up. Secondhand smoke is a real issue. It's not just about the smell or the discomfort, it's about health risks, and when you're a big star like Jenny, you've got a responsibility to the people who work for you. Staff might not feel like they can speak up about it, especially given the power dynamics at play, that's a problem. Some people might say, it's not that deep, or she's an adult, she can do what she wants, but being an adult also means respecting the people around you, and indoor smoking regulations exist for a reason, to protect people from secondhand smoke. Jenny can puff away on her vape all she wants, but blowing smoke in her staff's faces? That's low. 3. The way idols get treated in Western interviews is a joke, these interviewers act like they're picking from a menu, constantly bringing up BTS or Blackpink to members of entirely different groups, seriously, what a cheap tactic, it's baffling that they can't even bother to learn the members' names or basic information, and then they turn around and praise Western idols for speaking English, it's their native language for goodness sake, it just shows the lack of proper preparation, then, there's the serious garbage, racist comments, inappropriate jokes and flat-out disrespect, this isn't about being too sensitive, it's about expecting basic human decency, interviewers need to do their homework and come in prepared, it's literally their job, to those who think drama sells or complain that foreign names are too hard to pronounce, get real, professionalism is what really sells, and mispronouncing names is just laziness, try practicing, it's not that hard, the worst part is the offensive behavior some interviewers think they can get away with, it's the rotten cherry on top of an already messed up situation, change is long overdue. Fans aren't just whining for no reason, they have legitimate concerns, interviewers need to do their research. 4. Why groups struggle to sell concert tickets? There are many factors, first, inappropriate venues, companies are shooting themselves in the foot by picking the wrong venues, K-pop's popularity doesn't mean every group can pack an arena. If your group is still building their fanbase, stick to smaller, more realistic venues, know your limits and play to your strengths. Next up is lack of demand assessment. Just because fans are buying albums and streaming songs doesn't mean they'll shell out cash for concert tickets, companies need to do their homework, hire some data nerds to figure out if people are actually willing to show up, there's a big difference between clicking play on Spotify and buying a $100 concert ticket, booking a hotel and transportation across states, everything is pricier now, tickets, travel, hotels, people just don't have the extra cash to throw around, fans can't afford to hit up multiple shows especially when groups are only touring a few cities, forcing fans to travel. It's a financial squeeze, the concert scene is overcrowded, fans have too many options but not enough cash or time, if you follow multiple groups, good luck trying to see them all, the oversaturation has become more of a financial burden than an exciting event, furthermore, when COVID restrictions lifted, everyone was dying to get out. K-pop saw a massive spike because folks who got into it during the lockdown were itching for live shows, Concerts were packed in late 2022 and early 2023, but now the hypes died down, the novelties worn off, and people aren't rushing to see the same acts twice in a year, 
we've hit a new normal where the desperation to attend every concert isn't there, bottom line, poor planning, pie-in-the-sky expectations, and financial strain are making it tough for groups to sell tickets, companies need to smarten up about their tour strategies, and fans need a breather from the relentless concert schedule. 5. Giselle is not mistreated, it's baffling why some fans feel the need to paint her as some overlooked underdog, it's like they can't appreciate her without concocting a sob story. Seriously, not liking her outfits or makeup isn't mistreatment, real mistreatment is the horrific stuff that actually happens in the industry. Giselle's been killing it with features, podcasts, and more center time in performances. She's had fashion gigs, solo magazine features and her dance skills are getting major. Props, her fan cams are doing well, and she's got viral moments every era, plus, she's got the most songwriting and composing credits in the group, she's happy with her success and the narrative that she's the least known is just plain wrong, Espa's a small group, and it's natural for some members to be more commercially flexible, so stop slapping this victim sticker on her. 6. Guhara and Huna were never best friends, the spread of misinformation, especially when it concerns idols who've passed away, is not just irresponsible, it's harmful, the origins of such a claim are murky at best, and it seems to be a classic case of trolls not letting the facts get in the way of a dramatic story. The use of Guhara's name as a mere tool for shock value is gross and disrespectful. It reduces her memory to a trope, rather than honoring the person she actually was, Huna's. Personal life and choices are her own, dragging Guhara into that narrative is disgusting, and don't even get me started on the exploitation of idols' deaths for social media engagement, the commodification of grief, turning someone's passing into a spectacle for likes and views, is a reflection of a deeper societal issue where attention is currency. We should honor the memories of idols like Sully, Guhara, Jong Yoon, and Moonbin with sincerity, not for clout, and as for the causes of their deaths, speculation helps no one, it only adds to the pain of their families. 7. Kiss of Life finally earned their first music show win, it's been a wild ride for Kiss of Life since their debut, and seeing them snag their first win with Sticky is nothing short of impressive, despite the odds stacked against them with a digital single and stiff competition from a SM boy group, they've managed to win. Their journey is particularly inspiring for member Natty. The encore moment where Chan hugged her was genuinely heartwarming, a testament to how far they've both come. Since their days 16, Kiss of Life's ascent has been nothing short of remarkable. Trolls were quick to doubt them, especially after their company's previous flop with Hot Issue. But Lee Hain's creative direction have turned Kiss of Life into a powerhouse, their elaborate pre-debut series built up serious hype, and their comebacks kept the momentum going. One of their smartest moves has been tailoring the group's concept to the members themselves, rather than forcing them into a predefined mold. This approach not only highlights their individuality, but also shows how much they enjoy performing, making their success all the more deserved. 8. ATs has undeniably achieved impressive brand recognition. ATs have spent years crafting vivid imagery and storylines. Ask any fan about ATs, and you'll likely hear descriptions like the group with strong performances or the pirate-themed group. This level of brand recognition is something many companies dream of, sure, they don't own the concept of pirates, no one can claim ownership over an idea or concept, but no one does pirates like ATs, they've drawn inspiration from a variety of sources, and they're pretty open about where their ideas come from, even though their brand has evolved, most of us agree that it's so ingrained in their identity that changes don't really shake things up, KQ has done something quite clever here, despite having a complex storyline, they've managed to create a visually appealing and easily recognizable image. Each MB has its own unique look and sound, but still ties into the overall narrative. Teasers and trailers help give a basic understanding of the story without needing to watch everything. 9. I'm fed up with videos that focus on the dark side of K-pop, they're getting repetitive with the same old issues recycled each time. Extreme dieting is a problem, but it's not exclusive to K-pop. It's a widespread issue in the entertainment industry worldwide, Yet, these videos make it seem like it's a K-pop-only problem, and don't even get me started on the portrayal of Korea as the most patriarchal society. Yes, every society has its patriarchal elements, but painting Korea and other Asian countries as the worst offender is a gross oversimplification. The way these videos and articles exploit the tragic deaths of Jong Yoon, Guhara and Sully is downright disrespectful, it's as if they're using these tragedies as clickbait, insinuating that fans are somehow to blame, that's just low. Then there's the whole mandatory military service and sacing issues, yes, they're part of the scene. But to suggest that Western pop fans are saints in comparison is laughable. Fanatic behavior isn't exclusive to any one fandom or culture, and the plastic surgery remarks? Please, it's as if these videos are implying that without surgery, these idols wouldn't be worth a second glance, that's straight up insulting. 
it's high time these videos stop recycling the same old stories again and again and again. 10. Let's review Weekly's comeback with lights on. Weekly is finally back on track, Vroom Vroom was a standout last year, and now they're back with lights on, which captures the essence of summer with its upbeat tempo and lively arrangement. The song kicks off with infectious energy, setting the tone for a feel-good anthem, the group's vocal performance is spot-on, and the production is a kaleidoscope of sound, with synths that are bright and bold. The beat is dynamic, driving the song forward, and compelling you to move with it. The vocal hooks are cleverly arranged, creating a layered effect that adds depth to the track, but, the song does seem to miss a defining moment, a hook or a bridge that cements itself as the memorable part of the track, but I don't mind it that much, a rare case where a track didn't feel like it had a highlight point but also no weakness.